<clears throat> now, one thing that I do want us to do as we transition, and uh, how many of you guys make New Year's resolutions? Okay, nobody. No one will admit it. Um, I usually set goals for the new year. I don't make resolutions, but I set goals. How many of you have ever set a goal to read the Bible through in a year? How many of you have failed? <laughs> you don't have to raise your hand, right? But, the yeah, right? Well, this year, I, I want us to do something together as a church, if possible. And I, I like this system, the way it's set up. Um, because how many of you know it really is important to read the Bible? I am more aware than ever that people don't read the Bible. And so uh, because of that, uh, often we, be we believe a lot of foolishness. Uh, or if we do read the Bible, we only read certain verses and certain portions, and we don't read the Bible as a whole and get the overall message. Or um, we, we pick and choose the passages that we like. Right? So... I want us this year as a, as a group, as a people, to read the Word together. And so there's a system here. You can read about it on Reads. Uh, we're going to watch a video in just a minute, but I believe the, the website is readscripture.org. Now, there's also an app, and I, I hope probably most of us do have smartphones. If you don't, you can go online and look at this. But if you download the app... Uh, uh, you know, on your iPad or whatever, it's Read Scripture, and the app will actually give you um, a daily Scripture reading. And in addition to a daily Scripture reading, it's going to remind you to read your, your verses and stuff. Now, it's going to skip around a little bit, but don't panic, because I know some of you are really goal-oriented like me, and you're like, what? You can't skip and go to this place? But I promise you, you, it will take you through the entire Scripture, but it does it chronologically, and it does it in a way so that you can see God's overall plan throughout all of Scripture. Like the first day, and here's what it's going to do. You, it breaks the Bible down into sections. And for each section, it's going to give you a short video. I actually cheated and watched the first one today. It's about seven minutes. Some of you watch a YouTube video or something dumb every morning in that amount of time, so you can easily watch a seven-minute video. And uh, then it's going to give you like the first day, um, and you can start it now, or you can start on the first, um, but it'll give you like Genesis 1 through 3, and also Psalm 1, because they want you not only reading Scripture for the Psalms, they'll give you a Psalm every day, so not only can you read that Psalm, but pray it through. And how many of you found that praying the Psalms is a powerful, powerful tool? And so um, it'll take you through that, and, and uh, I, I like the way it's set up. So uh, my understanding is that this is through Francis Chan. I like Francis Chan a lot. I think he's a very, very solid guy. He's very solid scripturally. I've read a couple of his books and absolutely love them. And so let's watch this short video. It's about seven or eight minutes long, but he'll, he'll go through this a little bit. So let's just take a few moments and watch this together. Amen. Amen. Is that good? Amen. So, you know, and let's let's just pursue that. And, uh, you know, I would like us to do this, but again, that's up to you. Um, that's your commitment. To, but I, I, I like, um, I'm a very scheduled, orderly person. And if God's leading you to read other passages at the same time, that's very cool. But let's, let's make an attempt to read through this together. Amen. And uh, the app will actually give you... Um, the particular chapters if you want to go through the, those, uh, or if you want to use a, di a different translation, that's good as well. So, uh, but let's just, let's just pursue this together. Amen. Amen. God's good. Hallelujah. So it's good to be together. Amen. And, uh, you know, I know it's not quite 2019, uh, but I, I wanted as we, you know, I always like in January to kind of not only talk about where we're going in the year, but reaffirm, um, who we are, right? What God's doing, what God has said, uh, what what are our values, right? Uh, what's our vision? So this morning, and I, I, I'm not going to get through all of them, so it may take us a couple of weeks or three weeks, but I want to talk about some of the core values of Global Harvest Church. Amen. Now, values are really different from beliefs, 
right? A lot of times we think they're synonymous, but they're really not, right? Because you can have a belief, but it not actually be a value in your life. A lot of people are like, well, I believe in God, right? But is it a core value that they're pursuing Him in their life? Right? A lot of people will say things like, well, I believe, for example, that abortion is not a good thing. Right? But if you value life, you'll do things like care for children. Right? You'll um, adopt children. You'll make sure that uh, children have good homes. Amen? Laura? <laughs> That's a value in Laura's life, right? So values are things that you will live and die for, right? Let's make that real. What you value, you will spend your money on, right? You may say, well, I value this, but if you don't spend money on those things, then you may believe something, but you don't value it, right? That's the difference between a belief and a value. So. Uh, I, I, these are things that, and, I, and as I go through these values, we may not be 100% there yet as a congregation, but we're moving towards it, right? And I find that these things are always constantly evolving, you know, because God just gives more truth, right? And he's always trying to give us truth and revelation, and sometimes we're hard-headed. Anybody in here hard-headed? You could all raise your hands, Right? Uh, but sometimes we're hard-headed, and it takes us a while for us to get things, right? You know, I think they said that there's a, you know, even for people becoming Christians, there's like a, a scale and a model, and you go through numerous steps, and it it takes you often like, what, 11, a minimum of like 11 exposures to the gospel or something like that to to accept Jesus, right, and to become a Christian. So, God's always working with us. I want to look at values that we have as a ministry. Amen. And there are actually seven of them. And I'm going to list them. And uh, some of you that are, have gone through the Supernatural School, we briefly touched on these. But I'm going to list them, and then we're going to kind of hone in on each one of them for, uh, and, and explore them. So first of all, the first value is the goodness of God. Hallelujah. That's our first value. The second one is a culture of honor, okay? We'll explain that. The third one is community and family, amen? That's our third value. Our fourth value is the presence of God, okay? Now, I know each one of these are pretty broad subjects, and some of them will overlap a little bit, um, and, and uh, but that's okay. Our fifth value is is identity, okay? Our fifth value is identity. Our sixth value, and some of these are going to be like, well, no die, Andy, but um, our sixth value is the lordship of Jesus, amen? And then our final value is God's love for the nations, okay? So let's take some time and let's explore a little of these, and let's start with the goodness of God, amen? How many of you believe God is good? Amen. He's good, isn't he? And, uh, but sometimes we may believe that, but we really may not in our core believe it. Right? Anybody ever been there when you know that God, you've heard that God is good, but you're like, I'm not sure I've experienced his goodness. Or at the same time, you're like, hmm, God's just waiting. The other shoe's going to drop at some point, and he's going to thump me. Right? But God is good, and so, you know, we have to understand that we're sons and daughters of the Father. Amen. And His love, His grace, His mercy, they're more than enough to set us free and bring us into abundant life. Amen. God's always working for our good. Now, he, it, it, things go smoother when we cooperate with Him. Have you found that out? That God has a plan. Now, the devil has a scheme for our life, right? And so the, we're in this constant state of warfare where we can either agree with the plan and the will of God and move with heaven, or we can agree with the plans and the purposes of the enemy, which is to steal, kill, and destroy, right? But God wants us to agree with his plan. He wants us to move into his goodness. Now, 
I want to read um, Hosea 3, 5. And I think we referred to this a few weeks ago. Uh, but it's really good to look at this again. And Hosea is one of those fun books to find. So Hosea 3, 5, a, a minor prophet. He had a small ministry. Um, it says, Afterward, the sons of Israel will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king, and they will come trembling to the Lord and to his goodness in the last days. Right? Do we hear a lot about the Lord showing his goodness in the last days? Right? A lot of people don't believe that. I mean, if you grew up like I did, when we talked about the last days, there was never anything good about it. It was scary. Um, there were books and movies and sermons that s scared the poo out of me when I was a kid, right? And nothing seemed like had to do anything with the goodness of God. But uh, this verse actually says, now you can, you can debate a lot about what it means for the last days, and we're not going to get into that today. But the reality is it's the goodness of God that draws people, right? It's his kindness and his goodness. Now, he's still just, and he's still and he's righteous, and he's still holy, but it's his goodness, it's the kindness of the Lord that leads us to repentance. Amen? And so God is good, and it's really interesting because we all know the account in Exodus when Moses asked God, God, show me your glory, right? Show me. Now, it's really interesting that Moses asked God to show him his glory, and he'd already seen God bring the Israelites out of Egypt. He'd already seen God part the Red Sea. Now, I don't know about you, but if God parted the Red Sea in front of me, he removed an impossible obstacle, he killed all my enemies, he, he led me with a fire by night and a glory cloud by day, my, 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 my clothes didn't wear out, I didn't get sick, manna came out of heaven, occasionally he would send some quail for me to eat when I got hungry for meat. But I ask, God, show me your glory. I find that a fascinating moment for Moses to ask that. right? Because really, Moses, he had witnessed the manifestations of God but he wanted to know, God, who are you? And what are your motivations? Now, I love manifestations. I, I love miracles. I love healing. I, I love to, I'll roll in the floor with you, right? I love the things that God does that freak people out, you know, because he's, God, God is so funny. <laughs> And sometimes he likes to just mess with us, right? But the reality is Moses really wanted to know who God was. God, why are you doing all the things that you do? What's your motivation? So let's look at this in Exodus 33. God, why? Why are you doing these things for us? Why are, why are you calling us out of Egypt and into a promised land? Why are you taking us out? of this old way of living and taking us into something totally new. And, and we see this in, in Moses in, in Exodus 33, 13. Let's start reading in verse 12. Moses said to the Lord, See, thou dost say to me, Bring up this people, but thou thyself hast not let me know, where it's a lot of thou's here, whom thou wilt send with me. Moreover, thou hast said, I have known you by name, and you have found favor in my sight. Now, therefore, I pray thee, God, if I found favor in your sight, let me know your ways, that I may know thee, and that I might find favor in thy sight. Consider, too, that this nation is thy people. And God said, my presence shall go with you, and I will give you rest. So Moses is like, you know, God, show me who you are. And, 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 then, and then if you skip down to verse 16, or it says, for then how can it be that I have found favor in your sight 
I and thy people. It is not by thy going with us, and and um, and so that we, I and thy people, may be distinguished from all the people who are found who are found upon the face of the earth. And then, if you look down in verse nineteen, um, in that verse eighteen, Moses said, "I pray thee, show me your glory." And God said, "I myself will make all my goodness pass before you." And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you, and I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious and will show compassion on whom I will show compassion. And so God's response when Moses says, show me your ways, show me your glory. God says, okay, I'll show you my glory. I'm going to show you my goodness. I'm going to show you this is why I do what I do, because I'm filled with goodness. My goodness and my glory are linked together. Now, it's interesting, too, if you study the word, that the majority of times when God's glory is mentioned, it's, con it's connected to God's goodness, and the majority of times it's actually linked to the miraculous. I think in the New, in the New Testament there's like 30 times they talk about the glory of God. And it's always related to God doing a miracle. Why? Why does he do that? Because God's good. It's his nature. right? We've talked about healing in the days behind, past days. He's Jehovah Rapha. His nature is a God who's a healer. Even when Jesus did his first miracle, and he turned the water into wine, right? it says, and, God, and he, Jesus revealed his glory. And he's good. It's who he is. Amen. And he said, Moses, here, here we go. You know. Now, another thing that's interesting is that Moses also asked God to go with them into the promised land. Because God would said, I'll send an angel with you. And Moses is like, hey, wait a minute, God. And he said, I, if it's just an angel, and I, I love the angelic, right? God opens our eyes sometimes to see them. You know, we've studied them, we've studied what they do, we've studied how they do things, right? They're here to assist us as heirs of salvation. But Moses said, God, don't just send an angel. He said, God, if you don't go with us, if your presence doesn't go with us, God, God, we've got to have your presence. Amen. And, uh, you know, and Moses even says, and I think we read it in verse 16, you know, it, it's, it's your presence. God, it's your presence that separates us from all the people of the earth. Amen. You've marked us with your presence. I don't know about you, but I want to be marked by presence. Right? I want to be marked by his glory and his goodness. Right? Don't you love? all those historical accounts, not only in Scripture, but people like Smith Wigglesworth who would go into places and people would get so wrecked because of the presence of God that was on him. Right? Wasn't it Smith who was in a prayer meeting with other leaders and finally one by one they all crawled out of the room? Because there was such a holiness and such a presence that came. Now, that kind of scares me because we, we hear stuff like that. And we're like, praise God. And I'm just like, could I, could I have sit in a prayer meeting or would I have to have crawled out because of the glory? Right? Because a lot of people didn't like Smith. We love him now. Isn't it funny that history, sometimes we look back and, oh, he was amazing, but how would we have responded to Smith in the flesh? Right? That's a whole other sermon. Right? But Moses was like, God, we, we've got to be marked by your glory. We've got to be marked by your goodness. That's how you set us apart. Right? And man, the church today, there's such a, the church is in such transition right now. And we've so tried to be so seeker-friendly that 
there's such compromise in the church right now. Right? And that's one of the reasons why we're even doing this reading, because much of the church has no idea what Scripture teaches anymore. We're confused. You don't believe our society is confused? Our society is confused. It's just like what Francis Chan said. We've all got opinions. Right? And you know what opinions are like. We'll use the armpits one. That's nicer. They stink and everybody's got a couple of them. Right? We need to know what Scripture says. Amen? And so, you know, Moses' cry, you know, it reveals that he had a desire to please God. Amen? And he had a desire for the presence of God. And, and you know, we, we need to know who God is. So, first of all, so that we can access His goodness for ourselves. Has God done stuff sometime that surprised you? Right? I have said this before, but the funniest thing is when people get healed and they go, I don't believe it! You ever done that? I have. Or I've watched people as we've prayed for them and they get touched and they're like, no way! I don't believe it! Because that inherently tells me they don't really believe God's good. <laughs> right? Yeah. But we have to know who God is so we access His goodness not only for ourselves, but for others. Because a lot of people don't really believe God is good. Right? But when we become people that understand that He's good and we host Him in His presence in such a way that His goodness flows through us, we become a walking heaven. We become walking and living just like Jesus, hosting His presence hosting His glory, releasing revival and awakening wherever we go. Was it, I talked about this this summer, but was it Spurgeon who went to the factory in the 1800s? I, I don't remember if it was Spurgeon or um, it was Finney. Yeah. And Finney went to a factory and he so carried the presence of God that um, the workers began to weep. And, and he, he started getting saved. And the owners of the factory literally shut the factory down for two, three, four days to allow Finney to release revival because everybody was getting born again. What Finney, 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 <laughs> Finney understood that God was good and he was merciful and he was trying, God, God's plan is to reach people who are perishing. And so he walked in that and he lived in that and he released revival. And, and not only that, how amazing was that the factory workers let that happen. And it wasn't about the money or the bottom dollar. You know, Maybe they understood, and may this be true, right? <laughs> that Christian workers should be the best workers. They should be because they should have the most integrity. They should have the best work, work ethic. They should be the most honest and the most trustworthy. Now, may that be true, y'all. I mean, I've been in places, you know, you know, years ago when we were living in Shawnee and I worked at a bank and people, every time they needed a part-time teller to fill a position, they would come and ask me, that school that your wife goes to, that college, he said, can we get, is there anybody there that needs a job? Because there was something of, of integrity that were on those students, right? A, a lot of times at Bethel Church in Reading, they'll, they'll want workers from Bethel because they said they bring a di different atmosphere to our, our businesses and our offices. Isn't that awesome? That... That's understanding the goodness of God, right? Now, may we bring that atmosphere.
Now, it's true. I mean, there's sometimes some restaurants get scared on Sunday. They don't, they, I had a friend who used to work as a waitress and she said, I hate working on Sundays because Christians leave the worst tips. And they're the most demanding. Ariel's back there going, "Mm mm-hmm. Bill Johnson, if you're ever at a Bethel event, you know what he'll say when he dismisses people to go to lunch? Go, he says, go and tip good. And be nice. Be kind. We should all work with the public once in our lives, right? <laughs> if you worked with the public once in your life, you would be totally different, right? We, we have to understand the, and host the goodness and the presence of God. And as it becomes our core value in who we are and what we do and how we live life, you talk about a city being changed, right? I saw something actually that was really funny this week, and I kind of agreed with it. Now, this may offend some of y'all, so get ready, okay? There's more to generosity than paying for the Starbucks person, person customer behind you. Because most people that can afford Starbucks really don't need their Starbucks paid for. If you're really in need, you're probably not going to Starbucks, or if you are, shame on you. Unless you have a Starbucks card, right? The whole point was, give it to your wait staff. <laughs> right? So, now that's a, that's a good thought. I mean, I don't want to, I, I don't want to break that, but that's blessing someone, right? And blessing is good, but again, right? Hallelujah. Sorry to stir everybody up. That's, but we, <laughs> we, Right? We, we've got to host His presence in such a way that we're marked. Right? I, I want to host His presence in such a way, you know, I can remember when in the 90s when the river of God was really flowing and I'd, I'd come into work that morning and people would be like, oh my gosh, what? I just get in your presence and I just want to laugh. No, it wasn't because I had ugly clothes on. <laughs> Hopefully, Jamie may have seen me say, yes, you did. Right, but there was something of the presence of God, right? Or when I worked at MTech and and people, whenever they needed a dream interpreted, they would come to me, right? right? Now I wasn't always perfect, right? I am now. I got it going on, right? <laughs> but it's about hosting His presence and understanding that He's good and His presence is on us. Amen. So we. We live in that reality. Very quickly, I'm going to do another one. Wow, I'm not getting very far, am I? That video took a while. Uh, now, the second one, culture of honor, right? Now, a, a sign of a revival culture, right? When God starts really moving and, and it, there's a culture and there's certain values that we're pursuing is there's awakened love. Obviously, for God, but there's awakened love for others, right? And, and so um, Romans 12, 12, 10. Let me just quote this very quickly. We're commanded to give honor or, and to give preference to one another in love. That's a command, to give preference to one another in love. Now, I wish that they would have announced this at Walmart during Christmas season. <laughs> right? I don't, I don't know if people on Black Friday had that one down or not. Right? But, but we're, you know, part of having a culture of honor is that we'll honor the person and in how we minister to them. We'll minister to them in dignis, dignity, respect, love, and depending on the ministry, privacy. Right? If you come to Dwayne and Shelly for inner healing or deliverance ministry, right? Now, you know, and we'll study this in the supernatural school, and many of you have been through supernatural school, but 
you know, when it comes to stuff like de deliverance and stuff and inner healing, it's really not about addressing demons, though that may happen. It's about ministering to the person and loving the person and not letting the demon put on a show and humiliate somebody. Right? Because that, that happens way too much in deliverance. You're not there to talk to demons or ask them questions because they're liars. And you're not there to humiliate someone. Right? You're there. You notice when Jesus talked to the guy that, that had legion? People are like, well, Jesus, legion spoke to him. No, he was trying to communicate with the man. Go back and study the Greek. Right? He's like, what's your name? And the demon responded because the guy was so submerged under those demonic things. But Jesus was building a relationship with that man and calling him forward so that he could deal with those demonic things. Right? We'll, we'll honor and love people. I mean, it's a, it's a culture of honor that we're building. Now, you know, part of that is, how many of you know you have to, when you're, when you're walking in love and preference and unity, it doesn't come automatically. Have you, have you realized that? How many of you supervise people? Sean, Laura, Jamie, Kim. A lot of people, right? Now, is unity automatic? You have to give effort to it. Relationship takes effort. Is that true for marriages? Every morning, people, do you wake up? And you're like, I'm so in love with you today, right? Anybody do that? Maybe sometimes, right? But it usually takes a little bit of work, right? <laughs> you have to work at it. It's the same way with relationships in the church, right? It takes work. It takes effort. And you, you're building a culture of honor, it take, but it's so worthwhile. Right? A lot of people say, man, I am good with the Lord. Man, I just love God. Whew, I just love being in His presence. You need to shut up. I love God. Right? <laughs> we think, why, well, man, I can just get along with God, but not with people. Well, you know, that's one of the ways that God really works on our character. I'm good with the Lord. And well, the Bible says you if you hate your brother, you haven't even seen me. Right? So a culture of honor does take some work. Right? It, it takes that. It takes us committing to unity. Now, lack of unity will cause a move of God to either be completely aborted or to halt. Right? And we have to work towards building a culture of love and honor. If you don't believe it, study revivals from hundreds of years ago to even 10, 20 years ago. And many of them got shut down because of a lack of love, a lack of unity, and a lack of preferring one another. I was reading a book um, by John Loring Sanford. And he's a real pioneer in deliverance and inner healing, very prophetic guy. And uh, he gives, this is a story that will freak y'all out. Are you ready? But he was talking about a, a group of pastors praying over a certain city. And there was a, a pastor and his wife. And the pastor's wife had at one point, she was very uh, perceptive because of her past. And she had been a Satanist missionary right before she got saved. And her assignment was that, um, before she got saved, that she would become involved in a congregation. Her voices, she would listen to her voices, which you can guess what those were, and they would tell her the weaknesses of various ministers, various members in the church. And then she would plant seeds of distrust and slander, right? which and, until fighting within the church destroyed the unity of the church and its effectiveness, and then she would move on to the next church. Right? She was sent. Whether she realized that she was sent or not, she was sent. 
and she'd destroy the unity of one place and move on to the next one. And she demonically knew weaknesses in church members. Right? Now, the, thank God the woman got saved. And when they began to become aware of some of those schemes in their region, they grew pastors to get they drew pastors together and they prayed and saw the assignment and the deposit of evil that was inherited in that land uh, become healed. Right. So but but the enemy knows that if he can prevent us from living in a culture of honor. And y'all, slander often sounds very innocent. can be a slight undercutting or, you know, but we have to work to preserve unity. Amen. We have to work for those things. And, it, you know, as we begin to create a culture of honor where, where we love people based on heaven's value system, right? And uh, honor is based on, on the value of the price paid for something. Amen. So who set the price for your life? Absolutely. What, what was paid for your life? The blood of Jesus. The Father set the value for your life. Because right? sometimes we're like, oh, what am I worth? Right? But the Father was like, no. You're worth so much that I'll take the most precious thing that I have, the life of my son and his blood, and I'll purchase you by that. Right? Some guys, some musicians, right? There are certain instruments that they'll pay a lot of money for. Right? What's something that you would pay a lot of money for? How many of you guys? If you had it. <laughs> A steel guitar. Oh, Jesus, no. <laughs> or if you collect classic cars, or if you collect comics that are worth thousands of dollars, right? You set the value for that. But it was God the Father who set the value for your life. And if we recognize the value that God has set on one another, that that's heaven's value system, and we look at each other through that light, right? You ever take your kids in a store where things are worth a lot? Or just don't, right? <laughs> You're very careful because you don't want to break something. Should we be careful with one another? Respecting one another, honoring one another? No, that doesn't mean that we just, I mean, sometimes love says, hey, what you just did hurt me. I'm not saying to never do that. Right? Be careful how you do it. <laughs> right? But heaven's value system where we honor the person, we honor who they are because of what God did for them. And not only that, but we honor the gifts and the anointings that are in them. Right? When we honor what God's doing in them, if we start doing that, 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 the, the impact of honor in a church culture changes everything, right? It's things like keys to creating diversity in the church. It's not just all about me, right? It's about you and what you bring and the anointing that you bring, right? The gifts that you bring, those things and those strengths that you bring. I need you. We need one another, right? That uh, The body needs each other, right? You know, those things are so important, and it creates diversity in the church. It allows for proper functioning of the fivefold ministry. Right? I mean, there are things that, you know, giftings and parts of her character that my wife carries that I need. Amen? There are things that I carry that she needs. Right? There are elements that, you know, I need from other leaders within the church because of the gifts and callings on them. And if we recognize that, it creates a culture of honor and diversity, right? That makes the church so much stronger. It, it allows 
team ministries to be developed. Right? It allows marriages to get stronger. Right? It, it, it empowers churches even when we recognize, okay, there, there's a transfer of authority that needs to be passed on to the next generation. Right? But the next generation also honors the previous generation, saying they have something of understanding and wisdom and stability and faithfulness that we need. Right? If, if we learn to create that culture of honor, it brings transformation. But it takes work. You know, you have to be intentional about honor. Now, I'm not talking about flattery. Right? But you have to be intentional about honor and relationship and unity. Those things are so, so important. Amen? So number one, God's good. Right. Such a foundational core belief. And then we have to be intentional about being a culture of honor. And we'll touch on this next week when we talk about community and family. Right. Uh, that, that's so, so important. And it's one of our core values. Amen. So we only hit two of them today. Right. Praise God. Is God good? Yeah. He's so good, right? And I, I just pray that God just surprises us with His goodness in 2019, right? Uh, don't, you, don't you love that you always have great expectations for a new year? I mean, I just think that there's, God's put something in us that hope. Hope is such a strong thing. That, that we just hope for the best. I think that's one reason why, you know, I know some people are like, oh, we hate resolutions, and that's why I set goals, right? But I always have hope for the next year and what God is going to do because I, you know, God just wants to awaken the realization that he's good, right? So let's stand together this morning. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Father, we just want to thank you today. We honor you, God, because you're good. We worship you. God, I pray that you just, just radically, radically ignite us in this moment. God, that you'll ignite us, Lord. And, but we position ourselves in faith today because, God, you're good. You're good. You're faithful. You love us. And, Father, I pray that not only would there be awakened love in us, because we recognize that you're good. But Lord, there'd be awakened love in us for one another, Lord, as we go into this next season. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing. Lord, I thank you for all the victories. And the, even, the, even in times of, of challenge in the last year, God, you really brought us through. We all have our individual challenges. And God, you've been faithful, just as Mary testified today. God, you've been so faithful in the midst of so many things. And Lord, I pray that in this year, within this place, within all of our lives, within all of our spheres of authority, and God, within this city, Lord, you would reveal your goodness in and through us. And God, that we would host you well. We would host you and that, Lord, we understand that life flows through honor. Father, teach us to prefer one another in love. Father, in the practicalities, it's so easy in a, in a Sunday morning service to say amen, but Lord... I pray that you, you teach us that and that we walk it out every day. Father, with spouses, with children, with parents, with bosses, with co-workers, with people in the grocery store. Lord, that we become those that just, that your, your presence just rests on us. Father, we thank you today. God, we give you glory. We give you honor. Father, I thank you. We just close this year out strong. God, we speak health uh, to, to those that are sick, those that are ill, those that are struggling physically. We speak life, health, and strength today. And uh, Lord, thank you for what you're going to do in 2019. Father, I thank you that you're really patient and you really love us. And thank you, God, that you're working for our good today. Lord, we love you. We honor you in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. So remember, download the Bible app. Um,
it's a great way to track what you're doing. And if you don't have a smartphone, go to the website. If you still can't figure it out, um, talk to someone who's probably 12 or younger and they can help you um, with all those things and all those apps. But I, I like the app. And uh, um, amen. So let's just pursue that beginning on the first as we journey together. So um, next Sunday, we'll gather again. Um, today, um, actually today, we have no one available for the prophetic team. All three were unable to be here uh, for various reasons. So no prophetic ministry today, as Francis Chan said, just go to God and get it for yourself. Right? He likes to speak. Right? He likes to communicate. And so go and ask the Lord. If you do need physical healing, we'll have a team that will pray for your physical healing right here. That We'll have them just get in the center today. And uh, we bless you guys. Um, thank you for all your love. Thank you for all your prayers. Um, we appreciate you guys so much. And uh, have a great day. Amen. God bless you.